It's baffled scholars for two millennia. It is a puzzle made of multi-dimensional elements, an enigma with roots that reach back to the dawning of time, perhaps before. Daniel explained part of it. Ezekiel and Isaiah had glimpses into it. John saw it all for the time of the end. That time is now. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert on a journey that spans the course of history, from Eden to Mount Hermon, from Hermon to Babel, from Babel to Rome, from Rome to the cross, and from there to us. Biblical prophecy is coming true before your eyes, and to understand it, you must discern the times both then and now. It's time to unravel the threads of this all-encompassing prophetic paradox. It's time to unravel Revelation. Welcome to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and we're laughing because our dog, Grace, Grace the Wonder Dog, Grace the Rescue Dog, is roaming around here instead of just lying on her bed. Yeah, you're probably going to have, we're going to have a guest host this week, I, I, I predict. In fact, yes, I think she she's comes. coming right now. Hello, hi, Grace. Grace. Say hi. Well, uh, and in fact, we've got a, uh, a a special offer we'll be telling you about inspired by Grace before the end of our program this week. Uh, thank you for joining us. Please take a moment, if you have not yet, and get our free app. The app is important for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, it gets you all of our content, but more importantly, it guarantees we will never get canceled uh, because it bypasses the gatekeepers of big tech. Most importantly, though, there is a messaging area with groups that you can uh, uh, communicate with other like-minded mm -hmm. believers, especially the prayer request section of oh, the messaging. Yes. It is so active and we really encourage you to download the app and make that part of your daily routine because praying for one another is powerful. It truly is. And right now, uh, the way just looking around the world, but just looking within your own circle of friends and family, there are no doubt people in need of prayer. But very often, the issues that, that we see are, are not often discussed by uh, the people around us. And so being able to connect and communicate and share, learn from, um, edify, encourage others is, is really, really a powerful thing. This has become the most active app on my, uh, on my mobile devices. Oh, yeah. And so uh, we highly encourage you to get it. It's available for iOS, Android, Amazon, Kindle Fire phones and tablets. There are also versions for Roku and Apple TV just to get you the video mm -hmm. and audio content, but the messaging function exclusive to the mobile mm -hmm. devices. And we have links to all of those uh, app stores for the device that you own at our websites, uh, unravelingrevelation.tv slash app or gilberthouse.org slash app. Gilberthouse.org is really our web hub. And uh, go there because uh, not only does that connect you to the app, but it, all, of the, all of the stuff that Everything we do. Everything that we do is right there. Yeah. And when we left you last time, we were discussing a number of things and we kept talking about the Amorites and over and over again, well, they were Amorites and the Amorites moved. This week, we decided that we're just going to talk about something that the Bible refers to as, the, the Lord refers to as, the sin of the Amorites. Right. What is that? Yeah, it is, uh, th this is something that really came to mind uh, uh, and became a question that, that um, I thought was very important to address. In, well, in, you and I in Gilbert House Fellowship read the Bible out loud, and when we got to that, I'd right. seen it many other times, but reading it out loud suddenly stood out to me. Yeah, and uh, that's something that we do, and again, that's some of the content that we uh, we produce each week. Uh, the Gilbert House Fellowship is our weekly Bible study where we go through Scripture verse by verse in chronological order. And in Genesis chapter 15, where God makes His covenant with uh, Abraham, who at that time was still Avram, mm. He um, tells him that uh, his descendants will uh, w will be very numerous and uh, that uh, he is going to have a child. And of course, Avram said, well, how is this going to be for um, um, you have given me no offspring and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of Yahweh came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And, and interestingly, in verse five, we, we also often take this verse to mean that uh, his, his descendants would be very numerous, which of course they were. Right. And he brought him outside he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, 
so shall your offspring be. Now that has a double meaning, first of all, that uh, yes, Abraham and Sarah would have many, many offspring as they did, descendants who are numbered among the, uh, the of course, the, the Jewish people, mm-hmm. but also the Arabs uh, count Abraham as their father, and, and so he is. But on a deeper level, so shall your offspring be. He was yes, looking sister. at the stars, right? And stars in the Old Testament, as you probably know, are representative of the angelic host, the heavenly host. And so what God was telling Abraham was not just, you're gonna have as many descendants as the stars in the heavens, but they will be as the stars in heaven. In other words, this is a promise that his descendants would one day be reunited with the divine family. Exactly, I just wanted to make sure it doesn't mean we become angels. No, 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 no. We no. become part of the divine council. Exactly, God created humanity to inhabit the natural realm. We will not become angels. We don't, when we die, go to heaven and float around with wings and halos. That's a medieval concept that has nothing to do with the Bible. What it does mean is that we will be restored to the position that Adam and Eve had when they were in Eden, in the garden. Mm-hmm. Uh, we will be reunited um, like the prodigal son returning home. Yes, that is such a wonderful picture. Right. But the Amorites. Yes. Uh, Then, of course, God goes on to uh, uh, explain to him, and they make the covenant where they, uh, uh, he cuts a a ram three years old, a turtle dove, a female goat three years old, a heifer three years old, cut them in half, Mm -hmm. you know, cutting a covenant. This was uh, a well-known Amorite practice, right. Uh, Although the Amorites typically use donkeys, and I, I, Mm -hmm. I can talk about that a little bit more. But uh, he gets to uh, the the promise where he says, uh, your descendants will uh, know that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Obviously this is about the uh, sojourn in Egypt. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried in a good old age and they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the sin or the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. That's uh, Genesis chapter 15. Okay, question one, and then you can go on and explain about the Amorites. Was Abraham an Amorite? Did he come from that culture? He, he came from that culture, clearly. Um, the Amorites dominated the lands of the Bible, what uh, scholars call the ancient Near East, for a period of about 500 years. So from about 2000 BC, until about the time of the Exodus or just before, so about 1500 BC. Amorites were the dominant culture in what today we call um, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq. The Levant. Kuwait, yeah, the, the Levant and uh, the, uh, the Middle East mm-hmm. in, as, a, as a whole. Um, they, they first emerged, the Amorites did, in history in the middle of the third millennium BC, so around 2500 BC. Uh, the Amorites are, according to the Bible, they are a descendant of um, Cush, or rather they're uh, related to Cush, they're descendant of Ham, I should say. Um, so one of the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The Israelites, the Arabs are uh, Semitic, descendants of Shem. Uh, Ham is uh, typically remembered as the, the progenitor of the, the African nations. Mm-hmm. Now, interestingly, the Amorites are considered Hamitic but in all of their depictions in Egyptian art, and the Egyptian artists usually were pretty accurate when they were trying to depict their neighbors. Uh, for example, Nubians, very dark-skinned. Amorites, usually depicted as light-skinned and often red-haired. Oh, that's so, different. That is very different. Uh, and they also spoke a Semitic language. Mm-hmm. So now it doesn't mean they're Semitic, but it, that's that the language they spoke. Okay, so Ham was cursed, or his son was. Canaan was cursed, yeah. Okay. Did Canaan go and establish what we think of as the Mesopotamian culture? Um, there was a city built for him. Y- y- for, uh, for, uh, uh, um, not Cush, not, not Cush but uh, um, Enoch. Uh, when, when yes. th- and this is in the pre-flood era, uh, when Cain um, uh, slew his brother. That's right, that's right. Then he went off into the land of Nod, which means land of wandering. Um, and he built a city for his son Enoch, and Enoch had a son named Erod. Um, there are those, uh, the uh, scholar David Roll, who's featured in one of Timothy Mahoney's documentaries, Patterns of Evidence, highly recommended. Uh, Tim does a wonderful so job good. of bringing that history to life. A lot more interesting than hearing me just rattle on about it. Uh, David Roll 
suggested, and I think he's right about this, that uh, the city built by Cain may have been for his grandson, Erad, because the Sumerians remembered that the very first city of their culture was Eridu. Yes. Eridu. Named for Erad. Named for Erad. So, and it's possible to interpret that passage in Genesis as Cain actually building the city for his grandson. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it gets into some of the textual stuff that we don't have time to discuss here. I go into that in the book, uh, The Great Inception. But um, that is really interesting because Eridu was the city that was sacred to the god Enki, who was the lord of the Apsu, the abyss. And it was from the Apsu, if you remember hearing us talk about the Apkalu, Ap is a word that means water, uh, the, the subterranean freshwater ocean from which the Tigris and the Euphrates uh, emerged, mm -hmm. which in Mesopotamia is key because it's a lot of desert there. Without those rivers, you have no life. So uh, this god Enki was very important to ancient Mesopotamian culture. His, his uh, temple called the uh, e Apsu or the House of the Abyss. He, from there, he sent forth the Apkalu, the Mesopotamian concept of the watchers who descended to Mount Hermon, bringing the uh, gifts of civilization, sort of like Prometheus in the Greek legends, which I don't think is coincidental, uh, to humanity. But of course, in the Jewish tradition, they were telling us, teaching us things we weren't supposed to know, besides yes. co-mingling with human women. So post-flood. Post-flood, that temple was rebuilt. Now the Amorites, again, uh, emerging much later, uh, the, the primordial flood probably, uh, or the, the uh, prehistoric flood of Noah, who, who knows when that was. Yes, but this is why I wanted to go back and cover that because the Amorites had that, that, that culture, those references, they, right. they remembered those things as happening and it affected the way that they served their gods. That, that's a really good point and that's very important to bring up. So thank you for that because you're right. The Amorites, uh, again, when they emerged in the 25, 2400s BC, were remembered by the Sumerians who were in south, what is now Southeast Iraq, as uh, practicing a monthly ritual called kispum, mm -hmm. which was a monthly ritual meal, really a necromantic ritual where they would summon their ancestors by name. Um, if this sounds a little bit familiar with what's happened here in the United States the last yes, few years, speaking it is, name. yes, say their names, they would uh, feed them. That is what scholars have now determined that the teraphim were for, those household idols that Jacob stole from his father-in-law Laban, the one that was used to fool Saul into thinking that David was still in his bed when he sent mm -hmm. the soldiers to, the teraphim were used as part of this ritual. We'd summon the dead ancestors by name, call them to the meal, that we would feed them bread, pour out a drink offering to them, and then return them to the netherworld. And this is how we guarantee they continue to survive, to exist in the afterlife, but also so that they leave us alone because you wouldn't like dead great grandpa when he's angry the idea that their spirits could come back and haunt right, you. and of course it wasn't the spirits of ancestors, right, not right, at all. Right. These were demons. The spirits of the Apkalu, mm -hmm. the watchers mm -hmm. who became demons, or their well, progenitors, the spirits, the spirits of the, of the giants, Nephilim, the Nephilim, exactly. created by the Apkalu or the watchers. So just so you know, watchers came down to Mount Hermon. Right. They went into women, they, they uh, had children by them. The children were called the Nephilim. Mm -hmm. They were gigantic in right, stature, right. according to what we read in the legends, the stories, and even in the Bible, and also in First Enoch. They were killed in the flood. Their bodies were killed in the flood, but their spirits remained. Yes. And those are the demons. Right, right. And so that was they, they go back and forth. And, and that was that was Christianity 101 in in the early church for the first 400 years after the resurrection. Yeah. There's not a single early church theologian who would even argue that point. Um, and they understood that the the connection between Greek mythology and the so-called titans with the giants or the and the angels who who sinned mm -hmm. and their creation of the giants who then became the demon demonic spirits that still afflict the world. Um, Do me a favor. We're going to take a really quick break. When we come back, I, I want to go post-flood and try to figure out the lineage of the Amorites. Okay. If, we will, if you could do that for We us. will get into that as Unraveling Revelation continues. It's a new month, and we have a new special at the Gilbert House online store. We have a crazy, crazy deal on all of our DVDs. They are, regardless of the retail price, they are 75% off. 
We keep hearing from the kids these days that everything is going to streaming video, that DVDs are old school. Oh, not for us. No, we are old school. And besides, we don't trust the internet will always be there. So take advantage of this special offer. Everything from our travel documentaries. Basically, follow us as we go through the Holy Land and show you the important sites at Ground Zero on this supernatural war, plus video teachings, oh, yeah. presentations, and much, much more. You know, with 75% off savings on all the DVDs, as many as you want to get, you've got the money that you save to go out and buy a DVD player. <laughs> That's it. Take advantage of it now online only at the Gilbert House store, gilberthouse.org slash store. And thank you for your prayers and support. Welcome back to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and we have some information for you, not only about coffee, but also about our solidarity trip to Israel. Yes, the solidarity mission to Israel. Uh, we've had to push our tour back to 2025. Mm -hmm. um, just that, for safety reasons, because for safety the places reasons, we right. want to go to, currently you cannot go to. And given that it looks like the thing that things may escalate in the northern on the northern front with Hezbollah, right. many of those areas are in that region. So we're pushing things back in in and praying that things will be peaceful please, by next please. spring. But in early May, we plan to go to of Israel this year. of this year, May of 2024. Arrive in Tel Aviv on May 7th and uh, depart again on May 13th and spend one week really just bearing witness to what's happened there since mm -hmm. last October. Yes. Uh, we just have the itinerary just arrived to us today as we're recording this. So uh, this will all be available on our website by the time you're watching this. The uh, itinerary would involve going to uh, Tel Aviv, visiting Hostage Square, um, and, and seeing the uh, memorials that have been put up, but also the vigil that's being kept mm -hmm. for those who are still being held in Gaza. Uh, we will also see a display and exhibition based on the Nova Music Festival, which of course is that music festival where the uh, uh, the revelers were just s surprised and overwhelmed by the attackers coming over from Gaza. Uh, we would also visit several locations in the Negev, including the village, uh, the town of Sterot, where the police station was besieged, a couple of the kibbutzim that were attacked, uh, then have a barbecue with soldiers, mm -hmm. IDF soldiers. But we'll stay at a nice hotel, five star, four star hotel mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. So we'll be going to sites around there as well. Yes, and uh, that will include uh, the Temple Mount that oh. is on the tour. Mm -hmm. Uh, the City of David, of course, uh, we'll go to the Mount of Olives and show you not just from the Mount of Olives, look down on the Temple Mount, but visit the actual historical locations of the resurrection, the crucifixion and the resurrection site of uh, Jesus. Uh, there'll also be a visit to uh, Gush Etzion. Oh, that is the most powerful visit. We, and it gives you an idea of what, how the Jews feel now. Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. Gush Etzion was a very key battle in the struggle for independence back in 1948. It is um, the closest way I can, the closest comparison I can make is that it's like Israel's Alamo. Yes, yes, so you wanna go on this. Uh, the cost is? $1,950 US, that is the land package only, um, includes uh, the hotel accommodations, site fees, uh, breakfast and dinner, does not include airfare to and from Tel Aviv, uh, does not include tips for the, the, the guys and right. drivers and so Lunches. forth. So uh, 1950 US, uh, more information available at gilbertsinisrael.com, gilbertsinisrael.com or gilberthouse.org slash travel. And we're only gonna take a couple of dozen people, so right. please sign up quickly if you intend to go. Yeah. Uh, and while we're there, of course, uh, we will not be proselytizing, but we will be praying at all of these locations and Absolutely. praying for the peace of Jerusalem. And she's put, she's, Mom, that's my coffee. <laughs> oh, Amazing Grace yes. Coffee. We have partnered with a veteran owned business here in Missouri, Kevlar Joe's Coffee, to offer several blends of coffee. Uh, this is a young man who is a, a, a veteran, Nick mm -hmm. Fisher. And uh, he started this as a hobby. It is turning in, he's actually using this as a way to support a number of ministries, not mm -hmm. just ours. Um, and of course, we run on coffee here at Gilbert House. Oh boy, so, do we ever, and the coffee is wonderful. It really is, it really is. Now there are two medium roast blends. One, of course, inspired by Grace is yes. Amazing, Grace. Amazing Grace. And because she's black with that white blaze on her chest, we decided let's, let's make it a cookies and cream blend. So there's that just that hint of sweetness. Oh, it's so good. Mm a medium roast coffee. If you prefer an unflavored coffee, there's a uh, uh, snarling dachshund, which is <laughs> you know, like dachshunds, you know, they, they act tough, but when you get close, they roll over and you rub so their bellies. So it's not super, and, yeah. super strong, but. A Sumatran bean with a medium roast, but then 
the one that uh, we Bunker prefer, Buster. Bunker Buster, uh, inspired by uh, my, my weekly podcast, A View from the Bunker. Uh, this is a dark roast Colombian, which will really get you going. And you can find all of these at, uh, it ships directly from Kevlar Joe's Coffee. You can find it at gilberthouse.org slash store, gilberthouse.org slash store. And again, we can recommend it because it is good, good stuff. It really is. Well, Amorites, back to that. The Amorites. Um, so the timeline after the flood. Timeline after the flood. Uh, and again, we have no idea where to place the flood. Somewhere before 5000 BC, oh, if you're looking. A vague at, idea. Vague idea, but that's, you know, the, the Bible, when you read it, the sequence of events is correct. Mm -hmm. But we start arguing over dates. Of, well, that can't have happened there because it's not mm -hmm. the right timeline. It's like, We well, can get into the discussion of the Younger Dryas period and all that kind of stuff that maybe that's a marker of some kind. Yeah. Yep. So Canaan was uh, the son of Ham who was cursed. And when you read the account in, uh, in Genesis, it's because Ham saw his father's nakedness, which is a euphemism, meaning he probably had incestuous relations with Noah's wife, who may or may not have been Ham's mother. We don't know. The he was Bible doesn't say. He trying to take over as king. In the ancient Near East, this is how you dom de demonstrated dominance over mm -hmm. your brothers. King Ham wanted not just his third of the world, he wanted his brother's third too. He wanted mm -hmm. to be the inheritor of the uh, whole estate. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, Hittites, and the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, and, and, and so on. Uh, these were people who were probably um, located in Western uh, Asia, as well as the Levant. The Hivites, probably Mycenaean Greeks eventually. Girgashites, uh, that is related to an area on the western part of what is now Turkey, near mm -hmm. Troy, near ancient Troy. Uh, and the Amorites, the Jebusites. The Jebusites were probably uh, of the Hurrian people, or okay. the Horites in the Bible. Uh, they're the ones that David took Jerusalem from. Uh, Arana, the Jebusite, whose uh, uh, threshing floor became the site of the, the temple. Uh, Arana is a Hurrian word that means Lord. Mm -hmm. We write about that in our books, and, and yeah. I know that one of these days we need to sit down and just do a separate teaching. Here's the timeline that we think is, is yeah. the one. <laughs> we're open to other interpretations. And we'll probably find that we don't even disagree. We, we'll we don't even agree with it ourselves. ourselves some, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. So Canaan, who was cursed, was the father of all of these others who were then cursed, like the Jebusites, the Hurrians, the Horites, uh, and uh, the, the, the Amorites. Mm -hmm. And the Hurrians are known to have emerged on the plain of Ararat, below the mountain where Noah's Ark came to rest probably around 4500 BC, and they brought with them this idea of summoning spirits from the netherworld. This idea of the Apsu, the abyss, actually comes from the Hurrian word, Abi, meaning necromantic ritual pit, the pit you use to summon the spirits. Were they trying to bring back the Watchers? I think that's exactly right, or at least reestablish contact mm -hmm. with the watchers and Cause look the old days pre-flood that was pretty good they thought yeah the gods who walked among us who taught us all this great stuff like sorcery and spellcraft uh -huh. and how to divine the future from the stars i think that's exactly what was going on there the sumerians inherited that is the opsu or the abyss the akkadians call it the abzu um, and uh, the the practice came into the land of canaan and uh, the hebrews called it the ove Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the word that is often translated as medium in the Old Testament. When Saul visited the witch of Endor, that was the Ove of Endor, or the owner of the ritual pit at Endor. But this is a practice, and I go into this in the second coming of Saturn, you can trace back to the mm -hmm. plains of Ararat around 4000 BC or even earlier. So, and I think that makes a lot of sense from a biblical perspective when you look at the history of the world that the Amorites who came from the north and uh, with the Akkadians came into Sumer, came west with the Akkadians, but um, uh, were, were influenced also by the Amorites that were part of that, that great migration mm -hmm. around 2300 BC, uh, wound up influencing the lands of the Bible down to the time of David because clearly Saul's advisors knew where to find the owner of a ritual pit. So the sin of the Amorites, was that trying to communicate with the watchers. I believe so. This idea that uh, you needed to communicate with your your ancestors, but more than that, the Rephaim, the mighty men who were of old. The demons. These, yes, to the Amorites, 
they thought these were the, the demigod heroes of long ago. And in fact, we document this in our book, Veneration, that that's where the Greeks got the idea of their demigods, like Heracles and Perseus. Mm -hmm. the, they got it directly from the Canaanites. And the Canaanites are just Amorites. Uh, it's a geographic designation for the Amorites who lived in the land of Canaan. Right. You know, I'm a Chicagoite because I was born there, but I'm actually German, Swedish, English. So that um, I think is, an, is a sin that continues to this day, because as we've seen, it continues in the form of, um, say, the Day of the Dead in Mexico oh, and yes, uh, ancestor yes. worship that is still happening all over the world, mm -hmm. from Africa to Asia to here in North America. It was even, I believe, transferred to saint veneration. Oh, absolutely it was. In fact, there are scholars who have concluded that, that uh, it, we can put that on uh, Augustine as well. Yeah, in, so in the fifth that. century, yeah, it's ironic because he wanted to, uh, he popularized the view that the sons of God in Genesis chapter six are the sons of Seth, who was, for some reason, by marrying the daughters of Cain, created these awful, awful men called Nephilim. She uh, says, Dad, why did they do that? I, I don't know. But then at the same time, Augustine said, you know, we've not been able to get people in the church to stop with these ritual meals for the ancestors. So let us teach that the saints the righteous men and women of long ago, their spirits can still intercede for us in the modern world, so let's pray to them and at least redirect their prayers away from their ancestors to St. Peter and St. Paul and St. John and so on. And that's where the practice of venerating the saints in the Catholic and Orthodox churches came from. It is essentially just a Christianized version of the pagan veneration of the spirits of the Rephaim which are the demonic spirits of the giants destroyed in the flood. That, that I think, is the sin of the Amorites. You know, to me, understanding that concept and the fact that the Lord said it is not yet complete. Now you can say, well, he mentioned the fourth generation, so it was probably done by then. No, I think it's ongoing today. Yeah. And we are not going to, to finish that topic this week. No, we've got more to discuss on this. Um, I, I think we need to point out that uh, Babel and Babylon are two separate issues, uh, but they are related in the fact that Babel and Babylon mm -hmm. both mean ultimately gate of <laughs> gate of the gods. She's fall over. <laughs> Flat-coated retrievers. Are they are the clowns of the dog world. Um, that, that it means gate of the gods, and I think ultimately that's really what is at the heart of this iniquity of the Amorites, which is not yet complete. Yeah, the uh, descendants of Abraham would return from Egypt in the fourth generation, but uh, the oh, no, sin of the Amorites... You need to get down, sweetie. Yeah. Come here. Sin of the Amorites continues to this day, and in fact, when we get into... We might even get into Ezekiel 38 and 39, because we can show how these uh, spirits that the Amorites were trying to contact every month play a role at Armageddon. Well, next week then. Yeah. Until then, thank you for watching. This is Unraveling Revelation. Unraveling Revelation is a viewer-supported outreach of Gilbert House Ministries. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us through our websites or drop us a line at P.O. Box 78, Crane, Missouri, 65633.